Okay, our, our, my name's Doug Flack, and uh, I'm a farmer up in Fairfield, um, and some of you might know. So you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> our next speaker is Chris Masterjohn, um, and he has had a remarkable um, scientific career at, at a very young age. Um, and has been an integral part of the Weston A. Price Foundation um, since I think just before birth, something like that. Um, <laughs> uh, and he, he uses his remarkable um, mind, uh, scientific mind, to help us to understand um, the role of uh, nutrition in particular, food in particular, um, in health. And uh, <clears throat> this conference is covering all kinds of other things that impact our health. Um, but the context of food is really key. Um, it's, if, if you want your electrons to behave themselves, you want to uh, actually put the right things in your body so the electrons can, can behave themselves. Um, and, uh, and so that you can steer them uh, uh, more readily, the way Eileen uh, McCusack was explaining. Um, and it all starts with this soil. Um, and so finding really nutrient-dense food um, means uh, finding farmers that are really paying attention to soil. Because we've exhausted the soil over large areas of the planet, and this results in, in food that uh, lacks a lot of uh, elements. Um, and Weston A. Price knew that uh, and actually did a lot of measurements in his wonderful studies. And Chris is going to talk about um, his work in the first half of his talk. Um, but health begins in the soil and uh, fully mineralized soils with very high um, amounts of humic compounds is, is the pathway. Um, there are other elements to healthy soil, uh, good drainage, um, uh, sunlight, and so on. Um, but uh, that, that is the pathway, and uh, Chris recognizes uh, uh, many predecessors who understood these things and have been forgotten. Um, <clears throat> and uh, William Albrecht wrote the uh, introduction or a chapter to Weston Price's second edition of his book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. And he was a great soil scientist who actually mapped the soils of the USA against the health uh, characteristics of the people who lived on those particular soils and did remarkable uh, scientific work with that stuff and was uh, essentially excluded from the soil scientist world for doing that, for reaching beyond his field. Um, <clears throat> well, someone like Chris uh, will um, create an interesting um, explanation of these things in the context of the amazing work of our predecessors. I like to tell people uh, something that might shock them uh, as my final word, which is that Karl Marx understood this, okay? And uh, we, we berate Karl Marx for creating communism and what, it's all trash, we don't understand what he did. Karl Marx understood that <clears throat> farming practices were destroying the very basis of civilization. And he wrote that. So with that, I'll end. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I was asked, being the only food talk today, to situate a discussion of the importance of minerals from the soil and human health in the context of the work of Weston Price. And I think if we're talking about food, Weston Price really provides the essential context that's a foundation for that discussion. Weston Price. For those of you who know of him, how, actually, how many people here know who Weston Price is? How many people 
don't know who Weston Price is. Okay, well, we have some people who don't know Weston Price. We have a lot of people who do, but I think even for those familiar with Weston Price, I think a discussion of his work uh, is, is very warranted. Weston Price is most often described as a dentist, and there's absolutely nothing false about that. But I think he's best situated as a pioneer in nutritional anthropology and as a laboratory scientist, which is really an incredible fusion of, of multiple disciplines. And nutritional anthropology is the study of what people have eaten and how that impacts their society, their health, and, and other aspects of their lives. But Price started out doing a lot of basic laboratory research. He isn't credited with any of the discoveries in these fields, but you can uh, see on here some of his research was relating histamine to allergies, studying the effect of radiation of foods on vitamin D, various technological developments in dentistry, including some of the first radiological techniques. He taught a class on applied electricity. And he put this varied scientific background into a very intensive investigation of the causes and consequences of tooth decay. By 1915, he'd published 150 research papers, more than that. And his career in studying the causes and consequences of tooth decay within the laboratory evolved to his eventual appointment as the first research dire uh, first director of the research institute of what was soon after renamed the American Dental Association which is the mainstream American Dental Association that we know today and when that happened he assembled a team of 60 scientists and 18 scientific advisors. And on his advisory board were some of the most famous people in medical history at that time, it included Charles Mayo, the founder of the Mayo Clinic, it included Victor Vaughn, who was the president of the American Medical Association. And by 1925, he had completed 25 years of combined laboratory and human research into the causes and consequences of tooth decay all before he ever set foot to explore anything outside of the United States, which is the portion of his work that most of us actually know him for. And this early work in the, in the over these 25 years, led to the, vol uh, the publication of an uh, over 1,200-page book that almost no one knows about that was about the potential toxicity of root canals. But it also provided the foundation for why he decided to explore indigenous people who were immune to tooth decay in the first place. So in these studies, he found that you couldn't easily cause tooth decay in an animal model by introducing any of the putative causes. So dentistry then and now is all focused on the causes of tooth decay residing outside of us. So, you know, you could argue that a bacterial colony in our mouth is part of us, but actually it's outside of us, right? These are the bacteria in our mouths, and some people have streptococcus mutans, some people don't, and that's the cause of tooth decay. Or some people eat starchy foods, the bacteria digests it into acids, eating that food is the cause of tooth decay. But Price's research was indicating that it's far more complicated than this, because if you take any of these putative causes and you just put them in the mouths of animals, they don't just get tooth decay there has to also be some vulnerability present. So without ever denying the fact that if you have certain bacteria in your mouth and you eat certain foods, those foods will get digested by the bacteria and produce acids and that will degrade the minerals in your teeth, without ever suggesting that that's not true, Price came along and said, look, there must be far more to the story than this. There has to be 
vulnerabilities within the human or animal that are due to other factors of their constitution, of their diet, of something that's making them get tooth decay in response to those factors that everyone else in dentistry well recognizes. And so he was on a search to find out what are those protective factors because I've observed that they exist, but I don't know what they are. And one of the things that he noticed that was common between animals that were immune to tooth decay and humans that were immune to tooth decay was that if you took their saliva and you mixed it with powdered bones, the saliva of people who were immune to tooth decay would donate minerals to the powdered bone. But if you took the saliva from animals or humans who were vulnerable to tooth decay and you mixed it with the same powdered bone, their saliva would extract minerals from that bone. And so there was something about fat, sal saliva, even in the fasting state. This isn't saliva of someone who had just eaten cheese and so therefore had pieces of calcium and phosphate floating around in it. This is saliva in the fasting state that isn't mixed with food. And there's something about that saliva that's circulating, bring, you know, so saliva is not just uh, the water left over from the last time you ate a meal and drank a glass of water. Saliva is produced by your salivary glands. This is all being nourished from your blood. So something about the systemic nutrition is nourishing that saliva to be produced in a way that it is either rich and abundant in minerals and has everything it needs and so much more than that that it can freely donate minerals to something else that it's mixed with versus saliva that's hungry for minerals, that's starving for minerals, such that if you mix it with powdered bone, it says, ah, finally, and starts extracting everything that it needs from that bone. You can imagine if the saliva is extracting minerals from powdered bone, what is it doing to your teeth when it's flowing through your mouth? So Price wanted to understand, how do I find out what's causing the difference in these salivary properties? And one of the things that he recognized as a scientist doing laboratory experiments for 25 years is that if you want to do a proper experiment, you need controls. But if you want to study this in people and you're in a society where almost everyone has rampant tooth decay, where do you find your controls? And Price was operating at a time that was probably the nutritional bottom in our history. So whatever you would criticize about white bread now, it was worse in Price's time. It was... First of all, they, they used to treat it with, uh, with compounds that were more toxic than whatever they treat it now with. But the big thing nutritionally is that we developed the technology to make the bread white and fluffy and have expanded shelf life before we knew about vitamins. And so it was at a time where there was literally nothing of nutritional value in that bread. Now we've mitigated that by put it, fortifying the, the enriched flour with some of the things that were responsible for severe clinical nutritional deficiencies at that time. That doesn't create the perfect food, but it takes the edge off that. We've also learned that you can't just eat white flour. People had to learn about nutrition and say, hey, you know, like, th look at what people say about nutrition now. Mainstream, they don't believe that there's any such thing as a bad food, everything in moderation, but they'll say, eat your vegetables, eat your this, eat your that. And you put together something that's a lot better than if you don't know about nutrition and you just say, oh, this white bread is... Well, I guess it wasn't the best thing since sliced bread, but you know, uh, this white bread is wonderful. Let's just eat that, right? So it wasn't just the level of tooth decay that we have. At, in Price's time in the United States, everyone had really, really bad tooth decay. Meanwhile, there were reports from people who were studying isolated populations saying that they were immune to tooth decay. And so price, a light bulb went off in Price's head and he said, aha, those are my controls. 
But there was still a problem. What if you found these people who were immune to tooth decay? So what? Maybe that's hereditary. They just got good genes. Maybe that's something about their culture that's obviously different from ours. Maybe it's their geographical factors like latitude, altitude, or climate. Well, they just live in a better place than we do. So what Price sought out specifically was a way to create a natural experiment, a way to control for all these factors and yet isolate out the difference that he was looking for. So he looked for what he called primitive racial stocks. And he didn't use the word primitive in a derogatory sense. He meant it as not advanced into modern society. But he also used the word primitive racial stock in the sense of unmixed, meaning at the time, one of the predominant theories of dental deformities was that you would be mixing genes from your father for a narrow dental palate with genes from your mother for big teeth. And if you mix the genes for, from a, for, a, for a narrow palate with the genes for big teeth, well, obviously your teeth aren't going to fit in your dental palate. And these things seem silly to us because we have a much more sophisticated un understanding of how heredity works, but we didn't understand any of the mechanisms of heredity at that point. And there was no particular reason to, to dismiss that, um, as absurd as it seems now. And one of the theories at that time also, you know, due to the social beliefs of the time, was you're most likely to get this mix -max, mismatch of genes if you're mixing races together. If you have people who inherited the genes for a narrow dental palate from one part of the world, and they mate with someone from a different part of the world that carries the genes for big, pe big teeth, then you have this terrible probability that those teeth aren't going to fit in your mouth. So Price said, okay, let me look for a primitive racial stock, meaning people who have been genetically homogenous for ages because their society has been isolated and they haven't had the traveling in and out to mix their genes with people who came from far away. And let me find those people on the cusp of modernization where nothing but chance seems to account for why some of them are modernizing. So for example, he might find a particularly narrow part of a valley in Sweden. And he might find people who were very isolated in that valley, but then people a few miles away who had very similar traditions, very similar genes, very similar everything, except that they lived closer to a port. And because they lived closer to a port, the modern foods came to them first. It's not a perfect experiment, but it's the best you could possibly control for all of those potential confounding factors like differences in genes, culture, and location. During this, he took dental examinations, thousands of pictures, dietary surveys, ethnographic information, food samples, soil samples, saliva samples. He carried thousands of soil and food samples back to his laboratory. And remember, he came at this from the perspective of a laboratory researcher. So he was able to really study what are the nutrients in these foods actually. He published his findings in the first edition of Nutrition and Physical Degeneration in 1939. The, as Doug mentioned, there was a second edition that came out in 1945. If you buy Nutrition and Physical Degeneration now, you'll get the 1945 edition that's been republished with a new introduction each time. And if you get it free online, there's a free version online, gutenberg.com or something like that. Uh, that's the 1939 edition, and it's missing a few chapters uh, because it, it doesn't have the editions that were made in 1945. In any case, here are some of the basic findings. If you look on the left, you'll see Swiss who were eating their 
traditional diets and were isolated from the incoming modern foods. And do you see that they don't have any tooth decay and that their teeth fit in their palate? If you look on the right, you'll see Swiss, same genetics, same hereditary factors, same geographical factors, but they have modernized in the sense that they've had incoming modern foods and rampant tooth decay. The teeth don't fit in their mouth. Price generally found that the tooth decay was something that happened in the first generation and started happening immediately. The narrowing of the palate and the teeth crowding is something that would most likely happen if, a, if the mother was pregnant and eating those foods or maybe to some degree in early development. And as you went into the second generation, that's when you got the most dental and facial deformities. And the principal facial deformity that he noticed was a narrowing of the face, especially the bottom two thirds and especially the middle third. So one of the things that you can see in the, in the primitive Galax is that their cheeks are broader. And if you look at these kids on the bottom, you'll see they're narrower, especially this person you can see their cheeks are very flat and their chin comes to a narrow point. Actually, the younger you go in this particular family, the worse it gets. They've probably been eating those foods a little bit longer. And sometimes when he could, he would even control for the family. So in this case, he found the brother on the left using modern foods, the brother on the right using the native foods. The brother on the right has beautiful teeth. The brother on the left does not. He replicated these findings with incredible breadth. He studied the Swiss, the Gaelics, the Native Alaskans, the Native Americans, the Melanesians, the Polynesians, African tribes, many of them, Australian Aborigines, Torres Strait Islanders, New, New Zealand Maori. And he was able to not only control for the factors within those specific populations, but in this way also extrapolate the finding, not extrapolate the findings, but replicate the findings in many different contexts. So this wasn't something that just happened in one region of the world. This was something that was happening everywhere. Although his central expertise was in dental work, he was also able to a more limited extent find that the same principle was causing differences in cancer, ulcers, appendicitis, cystitis, and gallbladder disease. These were largely gathered by talking to local doctors who had access to patient populations from modernizing groups and isolated groups. And all of these diseases fell into the same pattern where they were st strikingly higher or maybe even present versus absent in the modernizing groups. There were a large variety of foods that were included in the traditional diets. Large and small animals of the sea, organs, bones, skin of animals, dairy products, eggs, whole grains, tubers, coconut, fruits, vegetables. Not all of the groups ate all of these things. What they ate was from this very broad menu that depended on what was available to them. But what they replaced those foods with was consistently the same. Price called these the displacing foods of modern commerce, white flour, white sugar, white rice, syrups, jams, canned goods, and vegetable oils. The reason he called them the displacing foods of modern commerce is because he believed the primary thing that they were doing wrong was not so much exerting toxic effects, but simply displacing the traditional foods that were providing those nutrients. Every white bread slice that you eat is a slice of something else that you couldn't eat. And the more of that you eat, the less nutrition you're getting. He placed, he placed a very big emphasis on really two categories of nutrients. One was the fat soluble vitamins and one was the minerals. He found that the fat soluble vitamins were about four times higher in the traditional diets than in the modern diets, and the minerals were about 10 times higher on average. And in his writings, he placed 
more emphasis on the fat soluble vitamins than anything else. And the real reason for that is not because they're more important than any of these other nutrients, but it's because food selection is so important for the fat soluble vitamins. The fat soluble vitamins are not widely distributed in many foods. If you take something like vitamin A, for example, liver is very rich in vitamin A. Most other parts of the animal aren't. So the wisdom and the character to select those foods or sometimes go to, if you don't have access to large animals, sometimes go through great lengths to procure the most nutrient dense foods was a critical determinant of the success of these cultures. And so he put that emphasis on the fat soluble vitamins for that reason. One thing, no, I did that on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you though. One of, the, one of the things that I'll come back to at the end is that these things are actually intimately related. The minerals being found in the soil are a critical determinant of the fat-soluble vitamins that you get in your diet, not just the minerals that you get in your diet. He then boiled these down to a handful of principles. So, First of all, the successful isolated groups that he studied put special emphasis on maintaining their soil. I think one of the most striking examples of this is in the Swiss Valley. When it would rain, all of the children would go collect the soil that ran off their hill by hand and bring it back to place it in, the, in, in their, you know, where it ran off from. And there were many other examples of this. So one interesting example is in the, Ga the Gaelics that he studied, the government had decided that the smoked thatch, uh, so they had thatch roofs and they burned moss to keep warm and it created a lot of smoke. And the government had decided that that traditional practice was the cause of tuberculosis. And so it started mandating by law that they couldn't live in those houses. So what they did was they built a second house, one to live in and one to burn the moss into the smoked thatch roofs. And the reason that they did that was because they would use the smoked thatch roofs as fertilizer and they found that their oats didn't grow well unless they did that. So once they made that law, everyone had two houses, one to nourish the soil and one to live in. And so these are, these are examples, these examples are interesting just for the principle and for the story, but what they show is that these people really understood the principle of the importance of the soil and they build their lives around, can you imagine having a second house because of the importance of soil, <laughs> right? They really built their lives around protecting the soil. He analyzed their foods in laboratories and found that they were often several times richer in a given nutrient than the same foods eaten by modernized groups. Swiss is a great example. The Swiss in the valley that he studied were drinking milk. All the other Swiss were drinking milk. So he took the milk from the valley and he took the milk from the rest of Switzerland back to the lab and the milk from the valley had several times more fat soluble vitamins in it than the, than the milk from the rest of Switzerland. So food selection is important whether you eat the liver of the animal or you just eat the muscle meat, but there's something different about those foods and probably a very large part of it is the degree to which they protected their soil. Consistent with the observations that he had made earlier when he would study these people in isolated societies who were immune to tooth decay, he'd take their saliva and it would donate minerals to powdered bone. And so he, he said, aha, I don't, still don't know what this is about donating minerals to powdered bone, but these people are showing the exact same signs that I'd observed earlier of what is the physiological characteristic of someone who's immune to tooth decay. And then he said, well, can I replicate this in my own laboratory? And he took this nutritional theory of tooth decay and he showed that 
You could induce tooth decay in animals by giving them nutrient-poor diets. He did the same thing that he had great difficulty causing tooth decay earlier when he was trying to introduce the bacterium, introduce the starch. Now that he could introduce the nutrient-deficient diet, he could introduce that vulnerability that would allow those animals to get tooth decay. And he said, well, let's really put this to the test in my patients. He was not studying this in the modern randomized controlled trial. He was trying to help the people that really needed help, but nevertheless, his results are quite amazing. So Price was treating children who had rampant tooth decay, but often they had far more problems than that. Often they had difficulty learning at school. Some of them had really bad problems like seizures and, and bone, bone disorders and so on. But aiming to restore the health of the teeth, he used this experimental diet that had three quarters of a teaspoon each of cod liver oil and butter oil. The butter oil he imported from a county in Texas that had 13 feet of topsoil deposited by glaciers. And he was taking thousands of butter samples from all over the world and studying the fat-soluble vitamin contents of them. And so he said, I want that butter because he was able to find out where the nutrients were highest. And so he would take that butter and then he'd centrifuge it and isolate the nutrient-rich fraction. And that was his butter oil. And then he would give them four ounces of orange juice or tomato juice to chase it down. He'd have vegetable vegetable meat and marrow stew, juices of broiled meat retained with green veggies and carrots. He'd rotate in Oregon meats or fish chowder. He gave them cooked fruit and rolls of freshly ground wheat and liberal amounts of butter on the rolls and two glasses of whole milk. They were with him for only one meal a day. He didn't control the fact that they were mostly eating white bread, coffee, and sugar at home but he allowed them as many courses as they wanted. So after they finished this, they could come back for seconds or thirds. You can imagine maybe they ate less at home the following morning if Price was giving them all this free food at night. What he found was that it remineralized their teeth. This is two teeth from the same person before and after the protocol stained with silver nitrate. The black shows areas of decay, and you can see as you go from before to after, the black area is greatly reduced. These are different teeth because he had to extract them to show this. He also provided more convincing evidence in the form of x-rays, and I don't have that only because I couldn't get a good quality picture to show on the screen. But if you read Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, you'll see his before and after x-rays where he's looking at literally the same teeth in the same person showing that the cavities went away. He, th these are two children from the same mother, one before and after the mother was treated with his protocol. Milk, green vegetables, seafoods, organs of animals, high vitamin butter oil and cod liver oil given to the mother while pregnant with the second child. You can see that the teeth are very crowded on the left, not so crowded on the right. Thumb sucking had nothing to do with his protocol. Price was not the only one to show at that time that you could reverse tooth decay. Sir Edward Mellenby, who's credited with discovering vitamin D, hence the sir at the beginning of his name, showed the exact same thing. He had a group of people who had a lot of tooth decay, and what you see on the screen is the blue represents the number of cavities that were currently forming in those people. And you can see on diet one, which was their ordinary diet, plus he added some oats, Mellon B was interested in the ability of whole grains that are not soaked or fermented in any way to antagonize mineral balance, which is a result of some of the anti-nutrients such as phytate that they contain. And you can see that in diet one, there were five cavities on average forming at the same time in, in the average person on that diet. Diet two was 
the same foods, but also foods rich in fat-soluble vitamins and supplemental vitamin D. For dietary sources of fat-soluble vitamins, they're listed on the bottom, cod liver oil, butter, milk, and egg yolks. You can see this dramatic drop in the blue bar and this dramatic rise in the heel bar, in the uh, red bar. So the red bar is the number of past cavities that were filling up. Not that Mellenby was filling up, he didn't drill any holes here, that were filling themselves up. And on diet three, he did the same thing, but he cut out the grains and he added more milk, more animal foods, and more of the foods on the bottom that are rich in fat-soluble vitamins. And the red bar gets even higher and the blue bar gets even lower to the point where the average person has almost all of their cavities healing themselves and none that are forming. I did that on purpose. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to transition here to talking a bit about minerals, but we want to keep in mind two things here. So here we're seeing Price laying a special emphasis on the fat-soluble vitamins. Like I said before, Price also wrote about the importance of minerals, the importance of, about soil, but really they're, they're deeply connected because of the effect of the soil and the minerals in the soil on the fat-soluble vitamins. So we want to keep in mind two principles. One is that it really matters what you select for your foods, and the other is no two foods are the same. If we look at minerals, Minerals gen generally serve what we could break down into four roles. Sometimes a mineral serves as a structural support and it's serving as a glue to bind a protein in it, into its proper shape. One ubiquitous example is, that's been very well studied is the zinc finger. There are a lot of proteins where amino acids have negative charges and zinc has positive charges. So the zinc can bind to those amino acids. And you can take a protein that maybe is like a long strand across this stage. And if you have the zinc, you can bend that protein together and form it into whatever particular shapes you might want to form. Kind of like a clown might take a balloon and form it into a dog, something like that. The zinc acts as the structural glue that holds it into that shape. And what we find is that all of the fat-soluble vitamins, or I shouldn't say all, but vitamins A and D act as hormone-like substances that have to bind to receptors, and the receptors bind to DNA in order to communicate that signal and change how we express our genes. Well, what zinc does is it causes these finger shapes to develop by folding the protein into that proper uh, structure, and DNA has grooves in it. And if the zinc is there, you get this interlocking finger shapes where the fingers slide into the grooves and that allows the vitamin and its receptor to change how you're expressing your genes. Well, if the zinc's not there, you have like a tight fist and you have these grooves in DNA and you try to interlock them and they just don't interlock because those shapes aren't there. That's not just true of the fat-soluble vitamins, but actually all of the hormones that have actions in the nucleus of our cells to regulate gene expression actually have these zinc fingers. So thyroid hormone, for example, same zinc fingers. The sex hormones, same zinc fingers. It's this ubiquitous importance across all these things. Sometimes they play catalytic roles, and that means that they facilitate a chemical reaction. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of chemical reactions that have to take place in our bodies. And usually the mineral's doing this because it's part of an enzyme. And the minerals that are good at doing this are minerals that are redox reactive, which means that they can gain or lose electrons. And a good example that ties both of these together would be the enzyme superoxide dismutase, which is dependent on zinc and copper. Zinc coordinates it into the proper structure and zinc is primarily structural. But then copper, because it can gain and lose electrons, can 
help the enzyme actually do its function. This is an enzyme that protects us against oxidative stress. You can think of oxidative stress as the wear and tear on your body that happens from free radicals and sim similar chemicals. They're produced in normal metabolism. If you have inflammation, toxicity, they'll go up. Well, you have this whole sophisticated system to protect yourself from that, and that protects you from degenerative diseases. It helps you age more gracefully, maybe less wrinkles as you get older, less, you know, who knows. And in this enzyme, copper is playing a catalytic role. It's allowing that enzyme to convert superoxide to hydrogen peroxide, which is the first step in converting it to water. Water is harmless. So in that enzyme, we tie together this structural role of zinc and catalytic role of copper as examples. Sometimes they're playing an energetic role, and that's because ions, which are positively or negatively charged species, can be used as a source of energy by making a gradient. A good example of this would be the sodium gradients that help us absorb vitamins and other nutrients from our food. So in our intestines, we use energy to pump sodium into the intestine, or we get sodium from our food as well. And we use the energy in the greater amount of sodium on one side of the intestinal membrane versus the other. And the fact that that sodium really wants to evenly distribute it itself across the membrane, we use that to drive glucose into our cells, to drive B vitamins into our cells. And minerals can also form communicatory roles themselves. Sometimes they're a part of a hormone. A good example of that would be iodine is a critical part of thyroid hormone. If you don't have iodine on the thyroid hormone, it can't bind to its receptor, it can't fulfill its normal functions. Sometimes a mineral might play a role in communication itself. Zinc is another great example of that. In one, actually one quite fascinating example of how zinc does this is insulin is stored in our pancreas in big structures that are bound together with zinc. When we eat carbohydrate, the insulin gets released, but it also releases the zinc. And it's the zinc being released that communicates to the pancreas that we're in the fed state. The insulin goes out and helps us bring glucose into our cells, but the zinc released in the pancreas is what shuts down a different hormone called glucagon, which is the hormone that rot, that's high when we're in the fasting state. You can imagine that if you don't have the zinc there and you have the insulin, but you don't have the zinc to play the rest of that communicatory role, you're getting half the communication. You're kind of in the fed state, but your body doesn't know you're not fasting anymore. And if you look at something like diabetes and insulin resistance, well, insulin resistance, part of that is driven by the fact that you have a lot of insulin, but you're not shutting off your glucagon, so you're not fully communicating the fasting, that, that the fasting state is over. Uh, so minerals themselves can play all of these roles in our bodies, and in that case, it's important just to get the mineral itself into our bodies. However, if we take a step back to a bigger picture, we'll see that just getting the minerals into our bodies isn't enough because these minerals are starting in the soil and creating or the entire ecosystem that we're part of. So if you look at the soil as the source of all minerals, the minerals are also playing these roles that I just described in the microbial populations in the soil. Those microbes are often playing essential roles that help the plants, including taking nitrogen gas and making it available as nitrogen to the plant, for example, or otherwise freeing up other nutrients in the soil for that plant. The plants use the minerals for all the things that we just talked about, but the plants also make vitamins. Well, what if the mineral plays a catalytical role in the enzyme of the plant that makes the vitamin. You putting that mineral in your body isn't gonna make that plant make that vitamin. Animals then eat those plants and animals get minerals. The minerals play all those essential roles in the animal. 
but also the animal eats the vitamins in the plant. And if we eat the animals, the vitamins are only there if the animal got them from the plants, and the plants got them from the minerals in the soil. But also, animals metabolize the vitamins in ways that optimize them for animal bodies. A great example of this would be beta-carotene. Beta-carotene is a precursor to retinol. Retinol is the physiological, physiologically essential form of vitamin A that we need. And what we know is that animals that have an evolutionary history of eating mostly plants are really good at making that conversion. Animals that have an evolutionary history of mostly eating animals, not so much because they don't need it. If you look at humans, we could divide this room in half and if we assume that we're a random sample of the general population. And we could say that half is really good at converting beta carotene to retinol. That half, sorry guys, you're only half as good. But get this, if I divide the room over here, this quarter is only one fourth as good as everyone over there. The only thing is, that's just numbers, right? So I don't know which one of you actually belongs on which side of the room. And what that means is that we have this enormous variation in the ability to make that metabolic conversion. And therefore, we have greater insurance if we get retinol from animal foods. But what if the animals don't get the minerals that they need to make the metabolic conversions to optimize those nutrients. So getting the minerals into us is important to prevent mineral deficiencies, but it's not a replacement for getting the minerals into the soil in a way that's bioavailable. I'm gonna highlight a few key minerals that I think are likely to be enormously variable based on some basic soil principles. Much more could be said about this, but I'm just gonna hit some of the points that I think are most interesting. If you look at soil selenium, you can see this very simplified map where all the white space in the middle of the country has adequate selenium. And as you get to the dotted areas and then to the diagonally boxed areas, you get less and less selenium. This map is actually really misleading. This one provides more detail. One thing that you can look is, that you can see is if you go beyond region, the dark blue has really high selenium and the white has really, or the white has no data, but the very, very light blue has very low selenium. If you look at any given region, you can see, you know, just pick any region such as this one, you see very dark blue in some counties and you see very light blue in other counties. Furthermore, you may live in one of those places. Where's your food coming from? And then further, does your farmer know about that? Because maybe your, fa your farmer's doing something about that or maybe not, right? So if you look at a map like this, you can come to these really bad conclusions like, well, if I live in Texas, I'm fine when really there, the variability is absolutely enormous. One of the things that's relevant about selenium that contributes to variability in our foods is that selenium plays no known essential role in plants. And this is actually really different from most minerals. And because of that, plants tend to randomly reflect the selenium in the soil that they grew up in. Animals have essential requirements for selenium. And so when animals eat that plant, they tend to regulate how much selenium they get. A lot of people say Brazil nuts are a great source of selenium. Which Brazil nuts? There's 20-fold variation in the selenium content of Brazil nuts. If you look across foods, plant foods can sometimes have as as much as up to a hundredfold variation in selenium content. If you look at animal foods, they tend to have about two to five fold variation in selenium content. Very variable, 
nowhere near as variable as plants. And that reflects the fact that the plants just like, oh, hum, there's some selenium, whatever. Whereas the animal, because of the essential roles it plays, is very, very much regulating it. Things are somewhat similar with iodine. If you look at the upper left, this is a very basic demonstration of how iodine cycles in the environment. You can imagine there's iodine from the sea that's evaporating and then coming into other areas. It's also evaporating from the lakes and the soil. It's raining down. And as long as you have, uh, as long, iodine's gonna evaporate, but as long as you have it raining back down on your environment, you're in good condition. One of the points that's been made about iodine deficiency is that mountainous areas are very vulnerable to iodine deficiency in the soil. You can imagine that, let's say the wind is blowing this way and you're on the backside of that mountain, that mountain may actually be blocking your access to that rainfall because of the wind pattern. And so you may have iodine that evaporates but doesn't adequately come down into your soil. On the right is something that adds some more nuance to this. So we can have iodine that evaporates from the plants or from the soil or gets trapped in the rocks in that soil or gets leaching underground. And there's two factors that are mainly contributing to that. So soil bacteria make iodine very mobile. Less soil bacteria means iodine's more likely to get trapped in the rocks. And also lack of oxygen makes the iodine more mobile. So if you imagine a, a shallow area that gets flooded, the water suppressing all the oxygen diffusion into that soil, and that will help mobilize the iodine. Now, it's not really good or bad, it's really about a happy medium because the thing that mobilizes the iodine, like the lack of oxygen in flooding conditions or the bacteria in the soil, that makes it available to the plants and it also makes it evaporate. So it's really more about the balance of the, and the harmony of the system than it is about we do want lots of water, we don't want water, we do want bacteria or don't. One of the things that ties together iodine and selenium is the massive variation that you can get. So potatoes have been measured from one part of the country and another and you see a hundredfold difference in the iodine that you get. In the case of iodine, no one has ever convincingly shown that iodine plays an essential role in plants, kind of like selenium. However, there's, it's very controversial and there's a lot of debate about it because there are studies showing that plants will grow better if you give them iodine. But iodine excess also tends to kill plants and stop them from growing. So you get this variation that instead of being like way high extreme or way low within your foods, you tend to either have enough iodine or you're just deficient in iodine. You rarely would get a case where there's too much iodine in your food. And another thing that makes iodine different from selenium is because the mechanism of variation is about this evaporation and running back into the sea, you get this really big insurance policy of eating food from the sea. So everything's pretty much running back into the sea and if you don't, if it doesn't get evaporated over to your place and you eat food from the sea, that's generally very, very, very reliable. So fish, shellfish, but especially seaweed are, are much more reliable sources of iodine than other foods. For copper, copper, like most other minerals, plays essential roles in plant physiology, just like in humans. And so you do get variation in soil copper, but because the plants are regulating their intake of copper, and so are the animals that are eating those plants, you get much less variation between them. And so you may have a relatively more copper-rich diet or a relatively less copper-rich diet based on the soil that your food's coming from. But your food selection is going to play a much more important role for copper than it would for iodine or selenium, where in selenium you're just pretty much a victim of your environment in that sense. Zinc is very different from all of these. And that's because if you don't have zinc, 
you'll shrink. Zinc is so essential to our growth and our metabolism that our body will do anything it can to maintain normal zinc concentrations in its cells. So yes, if you're zinc deficient, probably the earliest sign is you'll get some dry skin. Next, maybe you get a sore throat, maybe you get colds more often. But pretty soon after that, you're gonna lose lean body mass. And you're gonna lose it on purpose. Not on purpose up here, but on purpose, your body is gonna say, this zinc is so important, I'm just gonna shrink to retain it. And for that reason, Yes, there's variation in zinc soil. Yes, that affects the zinc content of foods within a range. But you're not going to get anywhere near the variation you're going to get from copper or from selenium or iodine because that same principle that if you don't have zinc, you'll shrink is true for plants. And what you can see on the screen is wheat and barley that was grown in uh, Anatolia, Anatolia region in Turkey with deficient zinc soil and they just sprayed zinc on the plants. And uh, C shows their little clever, they had a little cleverness with how they sprayed the zinc. Uh, but what you can see is the plants are getting brown and just not growing well if they don't have zinc. So in that sense, your food choices are really important with zinc and soil quality is going to play a, a less important role simply because if the, zinc, the soil is deficient in zinc, rather than getting abundant amount of plants with deficient zinc, you're just not going to get many plants. On top of this, we have, you know, to what degree are we trying to maximize growth versus nutrition? One thing that's notable through history is that minerals tend to decline in what we say is in the foods over time. And this has been hotly controversial because people say, well, we're just measuring them differently. Well, the, just this is different, that's different. But this is data from the Broadbach wheat experiment where in 1843, they took 16 cultivars of wheat and they put them in pl parallel plots where some plots were treated with farm manure, some with synthetic fertilizers, some with different types of pesticides and not. And they oven dried or air dried soil samples and oven dried straw and grain since 1843 and just kept it and waited. Presumably all those people died and then other people <laughs> continued the experiment. And they published this a few years ago where they were sh able to show from the 1840s through the 2000 teens that you had remarkable stability of all these minerals up until the middle part of the 20th century and then all of a sudden they just drop off a cliff. And so they were able to look and see, well, was it the fertilizer? Was it this? Was it that? And what they found was it was all about the type of wheat they were growing. We made a decision in the halfway through the 20th century that we need to feed the world and that we're going to feed the world by making dwarf wheat. And that's because wheat uh, will, especially if it's not nourished very well, will buckle over in the wind. And when wheat buckles over, you lose it. So if you can make the wheat short and it's less likely to buckle over, you save more grain and you can distribute the grain across the world. Incidentally, uh, you know, nutrient deficiencies can make the plant less strong and buckle, and buckle over more. So you can also grow more nutrient deficient plants that way, um, simply because if there is any nutritional vulnerability, that's, it's being masked that way. But what happens is when you maximize the proportion of the plant that's used for yielding grain versus the whole rest of the plant, you compromise the, what that plant has evolved is its metabolic machinery to make those grains nutrient dense. And so you see this massive fall off of copper, magnesium, iron, zinc, and it corresponds to this massive increase in the grain yield in the upper left. But the real kicker is what you see over on the right. The right is the harvest index. And the harvest index is the ratio of the grain yield to the rest of the plant. 
And you see that when we're getting way more grain, it's because we have way less whole rest of the plant. And so that's a really clear demonstration that if we modify that plant in a way that's meant to increase yield, it could come at remarkable expense of the nutritional value. So if we try to sum up some of the, some of the things, points that we could make, for copper, there's a, there's a lot of copper in liver, oysters, shiitake, mushrooms, spirulina, cocoa powder. There's, you know what, we're, we're running short on time, so I think, uh, do I have a way of, where's, I'm gonna find a way to make these slides available to you, uh, but if you wanna take a picture, you can take a picture, but I'm gonna speed on to uh, make one more principal point and open up for questions. So the last point that I want to make is to circle back to this principle that, yes, the food selection is important, but the minerals in the soil are determining a lot more than the minerals in your food. This is a study where they looked at boron availability. Boron is another trace mineral. And looked at the degree to which the plant was photosynthesizing and the degree to which the plant accumulated the nutrients used in photosynthesis. And you can see that as they increased boron up to a certain threshold, as they went from zero to 2.5 to here, at some point the plant becomes nutrient sufficient for boron, and you get this doubling of all the photosynthetic machinery that comes with doubling of the chlorophyll, doubling of the beta carotene. That beta carotene is beta carotene that the cow can eat to make retinol. And so this is a striking example of something that you wouldn't think had to do with vitamin A. Like, what does boron have to do with vitamin A? And yet, we see how it's impacting all these other nutrients. That emphasizes what we said here about the accumulation of the minerals up the food chain, and emphasizes what Price found in these top two bullet points, which is the emphasis that these groups placed on maintaining their soil, and the fact that they didn't just choose the right foods, but the right foods that they chose were two or three times higher in all the nutrients. That's not because they were maintaining vitamin A in the soil. There is no vitamin A in the soil. So it must be the microbial ecology of the soil and the minerals present in the soil that's, that, was, that was operating in that principle. So my conclusions are we need to s select the nutrient-dense types of foods but we also need to support farmers who are really knowledgeable about soil and take great care to nourish it and balance it. I'm not a soil scientist, I'm a nutrition expert, and, uh, but it's, you know, it's clear here that soil science knowledge that goes well beyond what I have is really key to making foods nutritious. Supplements may have a place, but they're not gonna replace proper nourishment in the soil. My expertise allows me to produce much more content around assessing nutritional status uh, I, if you go to chrismasterjohnphd.com slash marker, I have a series on how to assess nutritional status that would be a great adjunct to this type of stuff. I'm pretty easy to find. My website's chrismasterjohnphd.com. I'm at chrismasterjohn on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, YouTube. I have a podcast called Mastering Nutrition. That's on my website or in your favorite podcast app. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. So the question was, does cooking animal protein affect the way that it's digested and absorbed? Yes, but not in a way that is 100% in one direction or the other. So a lot of things become more digestible. Other things are destroyed. So I think it's best to eat a mix of raw food and gently cooked food and to avoid extreme cooking conditions. If you take something like vi vitamin A, um, well, in the case of, you asked specifically about animal protein. Um, 
There are certain animal proteins that are mostly found in egg whites and milk products that are very, where their biological value is very vulnerable to heat. Most animal proteins, that's not the case. So in general, cooking is just going to make it more digestible. But in the case of, of milk, uh, milk would be a great example of an animal protein where there's very unique bonds in the whey protein that are very powerful support for the antioxidant system when we consume that milk product. And even the heat of pasteurization destroys about half of them. Uh, but that's not something that's true across animal proteins. It's something that's particular to the proteins in milk. Um, but that said, just as a general principle, there's a lot of nutrients that are made more bioavailable by cooking and a lot of nutrients that are destroyed by cooking. So I think it's really a matter of balance. Yep. Could you give an, a specific example of a test you're talking about? Yeah, okay, so the question is, are tests that holistic doctors use to assess nutritional status reliable? There's no one answer to that question because it's really a test-by-test -test basis. So I'm, I, that, that's why I'm making this series that I, that I just put on this screen on, on my website that where I'm doing a deep dive into each particular nutrient and talking about the best markers of nutritional status. It's something that can't be answered across the board. So I think that you have a, there's a lot of tests and some are more reliable on, than others. You brought up vitamin D as an example. So uh, you, when you get your vitamin D status tested, it's, you get a compound called 25-OHD tested. That's a very reliable index of vitamin D if you're controlling for all the other factors that could affect it. So for example, if you take people and you just supplement them with different doses of vitamin D, you can back calculate how much vitamin D they were taking in based on that level in their blood. But if you just take some random person, their 25 OHD is low, uh, you, it's not as reliable as people think it is in terms of interpreting it that the problem is they don't have enough vitamin D. Uh, there could be inflammation that could affect it. There could be, uh, hopefully not, but there could be cancer affecting it. There could be uh, injury affecting it, there could be calcium affecting it, there could be vitamin A affecting it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that, but I, but I mean, I can't answer your question yes or no because it's just the person measuring that probably should be measuring it, but should understand all the caveats to how you interpret it. And the real gap that we have is less about people using the wrong tests and it's more about lack of understanding of fully thinking through all the things that that test could indicate. So I think the 25 OHD test is good. People are using it too simplistically. Yep. I th so I think every statement that, not just that statement, but every one that is of its type is all false. So everyone who's ever made a statement like, it's better to measure it in bread blood cells than in plasma, or it's better to measure it in saliva than in urine, every single statement that's ever been made like that is completely false. So the thing is, when you try to understand what is a good marker of nutritional status or disease status or whatever, you have to validate it and you have to understand why it gets the way that it does. Sometimes the best marker of nutritional status is the plasma level of a nutrient. It's not very sophisticated and nuanced, doesn't sound very fancy, but it is not because that's a true principle that always applies, but because we've done all the testing to say, well, what happens if you make this person slightly deficient? What's the first blood marker to differ? What happens if they get really deficient? What's the first one to differ? What if we go to China and we find selenium deficient soils, people with massive deficiency? What markers improve as we show that they improve? 
That's how you show that a marker is good. And sometimes you just don't have the data to show it, but you, you can't make a rule that says you want to measure it in this tissue or in that tissue because it's different for each one. Yep? Can you make that a more specific question? Well, my, my, so my simple answer is that ketogenic diets are, are clearly valuable for refractory epilepsy. They're promising for a lot of other neurological, neurological conditions. They maybe have applications to things like cancer. I think the jury is way, 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 way out on that. And, and anecdotally, a lot of people who have... I mean, really the most convincing stuff is the neurological stuff, whether it's something really well studied like refractory epilepsy or something that's totally anecdotal, like I got this infection and now I have brain fog and I went on a ketogenic diet and now I can think again. Um, you know, all those neurological things are really where it seems to have good application and I think that's because there's metabolic factors that are just hurt by certain processes that just hurt glucose metabolism in the brain more than they hurt ketone metabolism in the brain. Um, I think, I think the level to which it's advocated on the internet is massively disproportionate to the level for which there's even a rational case to be made for it. One of the things you have to keep in mind is that probably no human population ever on the face of the planet was consistently in a ketogenic state on a year-round basis. Even the people who have tried, you know, if there's anyone who was ketogenic on their traditional diets, it's the Inuit. But no one's ever been able to show that they were ketogenic on their traditional diets, even when they've tried. Uh, so, so the ketogenic state is, a, is, in your body, it's primarily designed to support your ability to fast. When you wake up in the morning, you're ketogenic. You're not going to be as ketogenic as you would be on a seven-day fast or on a diet made for refractory epilepsy, but you're gonna have measurable ketones in your blood and because that's a natural adaptation to burning fat while you're fasting. It's not a natural adaptation to eating a fat-based diet. No one's, like I said before, even at the extremes of fat-based diet in the Arctic, it's not clear that those people were, were consistently ketogenic. Uh, so the ketogenic diet is not a traditional diet. It's a diet that was used as a tool to harness the principle of ketogenesis to treat disordered conditions of metabolism. Um, I'm not against the ketogenic diet. I just, but there's, it, I, I mean, I get emails from people who are like, we're we're putting people on a ketogenic diet and their, their CRP, which is a marker of inflammation, and their cortisol is going through the roof. Do you have any idea what, what might be happening? Yeah, you, like you put these people on a ketogenic diet that didn't need to be on a ketogenic diet, and why wouldn't, you, why wouldn't their cortisol rise? Cortisol is something that rises to help you convert protein into glucose when you don't have any glucose in your system. Like, why would you expect to go on a like, very low-carbohydrate diet, and why would you ask the question, why is the cortisol high? Those people don't want to hear that, so they're like, they read my email and they're like, there must be something else going on here. <laughs> so, yeah. Sure. Yep. Sure. I think I'm a really bad person to ask that question. So I come from this as a nutrition scientist and I and I and I this talk is really operating on the border of me trying to tie in soil to the best I understand it to what I really understand which is nutrition. If I give you advice it's going to be bad advice. What would I do dietarily for bone health? First of all, I'd get a personal trainer and I'd start lifting weights. I think that anyone who's in this room is probably doing way better with diet uh, and they're probably operating like 80% diet. Maybe they can get some advice from me that can bring that up to 90%, 95%. Uh, there's really two things that your bones want 
to be healthy, and one is they want to know that they're valuable. And if you don't get exercise, you your bones are like, well, you don't need me, like whatever, I'm out of here. And if you don't have good nutrition, then that's that's equally important. But like, if you take someone who's eating the standard diet, probably nutrition is super important for that person because their nutrition's bad. But when you take someone who's eating a really good nutritious diet, and because of our lifestyles, we and it, you know it's not it's not just 20th century lifestyles. For a very long time, we've been out of the wild. You take someone who's in a hunter-gatherer society where they're running and ducking and doing and lifting this and carrying that, they probably don't need to go to a gym. But if you have, even if you're not sitting in front of a computer, like most things that most people do in our society just don't provide enough anabolic stimulus for the bones. And one of the things that's really bad as people age is not just loss of bone mass, it's sarcopenia. And so I think lifting weights is one of the most important things anyone can do for that. That said, I think for nutrition, uh, the fat-soluble vitamins are really important. The stuff that Price was doing for the teeth is more or less the same stuff you want to do for your bones. Um, vitamin K2 is really underappreciated in that context. Calcium and vitamin D are important, but somewhat overvalued. Vitamin A is maligned because it may contribute to osteoporosis when you're vitamin D deficient, but most likely that's a mistake and vitamin A is really important if you're getting your other nutrients in. Uh, I think those are the big, the big key factors, yeah. Well, you can do Fosamax if you want. I wouldn't do it. Sure. I'll do number two first. I don't know anything about oil pulling with coconut oil except from oil pulling with coconut oil. So I read about oil pulling like 15 years ago and I was like, why don't you do that with coconut oil instead? So I started doing that and I didn't write a book about it and then someone else did. Um, I, you know, uh, honestly, the reason I was doing it was because I was getting canker sores and nothing else was working. And I figured that if I switch it around, it'll release the fatty acids that will have antiviral properties and it seemed to work. So I think it's good for that, but I don't know anything about the science besides what I was speculating. Your other question was vegetarianism. So, uh, is a vegetarian diet ever genetically healthy? Let me rephrase that. I, you know, it, can someone have genetics that makes them do well on a vegetarian diet? Sure. I think there's two ways to look at this. One is, can you be healthy on a vegetarian diet? And I think the answer is yes. If your genetics are optimized for, for making those metabolic conversions that animal, I mentioned vitamin A, but essential fatty acids, vitamin B6, and several other nutrients undergo those metabolic conversions in animal foods. Some just accumulate better in animal foods than others. Zinc is a great example for that. Um, it, you know, if your genetics are optimized to derive those nutrients from plant foods, then you're, you can probably do really well on a vegetarian diet. The thing is, w you don't know what your genetics are. You can go get 23 in me, but you still don't know what most of your relevant genetics are just because we don't know enough about the genetics to predict that in someone. So you're kind of playing the lottery if you do that. In a sense, everything sorts itself out because if you're like me and your teeth fall apart on a vegan diet, you're not going to be vegan anymore. And that's one of the reasons why these observational studies about the health of vegetarians and vegans are really stupid because... Uh, who, like, who, like, who cares what a self-chosen vegan of 10 years' is, health is compared to someone like me who stopped being vegan? Like, I stopped being vegan because I wasn't healthy, right? So if you, I think, um, if you, I think the better question isn't really can you be healthy on that diet, where the answer is yes. I think the better question is, what is the most robust 
way, dietary approach to meet whatever your values are. So let's say you're against factory farming or you're, let's say you don't want to eat anything with a face. If you ate clams once or twice a month and you ate oysters once or twice a month and you ate, and let's just stop there. Your diet is more robust to providing iron, zinc, and copper than it would be if you ate turkey sandwiches every day. And yet, you're not eating anything with a face. Or let's say your goal is, I want to reduce animal products down to 2% of my diet, but I don't care what's in that 2%. Well, you could do what I just described and eat liver once a week, and you can eat 98% plant products, and now you're more robust to vitamin, you know, now you're not gonna get any serious vitamin A deficiency either, no matter what your genetics are, right? So there's no, there's nothing except absolutism and ideology that can drive one to the choice of a 100% animal-free diet. Or, or, I mean, even if you're, it's about animal cruelty, it's far less cruel to eat oysters once or twice a month and clams once or twice a month than to eat factory farm dairy and eggs on a daily basis. Dairy and eggs are far more cruel than eating meat because of the way those animals are treated, right? So if you can talk someone into distilling out the actual principles that they care about, you can always find a more nutritionally robust solution to those principles than what you get out of vegetarianism or veganism? That's the important question. But the question of can someone be healthy on that diet, the answer for almost any diet is yes. In the back? You're welcome. You, thank you for your comment. You're welcome. Um, I, you know, I. So the the for anyone who had trouble hearing, uh, correct me if I'm if I uh, misstate your comment. But when you see vegans, they always have rampant tooth decay, and when you add animal products in, the heart health and bone health improves. Is that fair? Yeah. So I, you know, I think. Right. The vegan diet is far less nutritionally robust than the veg lacto vegetarian diet which is less robust than, and, than a diet that doesn't restrict nutrient-dense animal foods. Like, that, that's, that's just true. The question was about, the original question was about vegetarianism, and I think that veganism is less nutritionally robust than vegetarianism. But I think you could design a, a vegan, but you know, part of the issue is, are you a doctor, or like, what, how are you seeing these people? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, my, my teeth were terrible on, on a vegan diet, um, but when I said that it is possible to be healthy on a vegetarian diet, I think you can design a lacto of a vegetarian diet that if you could find the people with the right genetics, it would work well for that person. I think if you take the, the people, you take a random sample of people from the population and they go on a vegan diet because they heard about veganism and thought it was gonna save the environment and save the animals and save their health. Well, you just took a pool of people that includes maybe some people who, are, who can tolerate that diet well, but mostly contains people who, who don't. And probably it's, the, you know, it's that majority that doesn't tolerate it well, plus their diet is not, most vegan diets are poorly designed because most vegans don't believe that there's any cause of disease except animal foods. So if you believe something that ridiculous, then you're not even gonna try to make the vegan diet good. I'm not saying no one does, but I'm just saying the average person who's walking into this thinking that veganism versus non-veganism is the key to health is not gonna read about 
well, maybe I should be using this oil versus that oil or this food versus that food. So I think it, what you get when you just look at a sample of people coming into a clinical setting is you get this hodgepodge of just a principle that you and I agree on, which is most people, for most people, the vegan diet is nowhere near the best diet. Um, but that's also mixed with no one did anything to try to find, well, do I do well on a vegan diet? They just did it. And then also, probably most of those people probably could find a better vegan diet than the one that they have. But if I were, you know, you're you, and if I were you, I wouldn't care about that except in answering this question at a theoretical level. It's just, like I said before, it's just, there are, you can find the principles that that person cares about and find a much better way to meet those principles that doesn't compromise their nutrition. Um, in the back? Yeah, I skipped over that. So I should have pointed that out. Um, that point is just that what it says. So the boron availability in the soil is not the same thing as the bor boron content of the soil. And just like you can't just, you know, boron is interesting because there's some, I would say it's wishy-washy evidence, but there's some interest in boron supplementation for improving hormonal health, for example. But, you know, the point is, if the boron's deficient in the soil, you're also getting a deficiency of these things. But then that same argument, like the analogous argument is, well, does just putting boron in the soil do it? Well, not if the ecology of the soil is antagonistic to the availability of that boron. And so, you, so that same principle that you need to understand the soil way more than throwing stuff at it applies to the soil as well as the person. How much zinc are you supplementing with? Probably not, but I would anyway. So the thing with zinc is there's a protein called metallothionine, which is a, it's like a mop for metals. And zinc is the primary regulator of it. But if you have a real lot of zinc, it can bind up other metals, including copper. I think it's good to bout, like to keep zinc in a 10 to maybe a somewhere between like a 5 to 1 or a 15 to 1 ratio with copper where zinc is the more abundant one. <coughs> but I think it would be really deceptive to take like 50 milligrams of zinc and take that ratio of copper and think that you're all in the clear because metallothionine is also going to bind a lot of other trace minerals that are much more poorly studied. Copper is the one that everyone knows about, but what's it doing to your molybdenum? What's your, what's it, like any positively charged metal can be antagonized in that way. So I think you want to keep zinc into reasonable boundaries. And at that level, you can probably just care about the copper, but you got to start caring about a lot more if you start adding a lot more zinc in. But... If your 15 milligrams of zinc is unlikely to hurt your copper status, I would just, I, I, like, I like Gero zinc balance because uh, it takes care of that for you and puts the copper in there. I would take the copper anyway, even though I think it's unlikely to be a problem because it's no harm in taking the copper, you know? Uh, like, I'd, ra I'd, rather, I'd rather just get the balance rather than gambling with the fact that I probably don't need it. Does that make sense? No. It has nothing to do with an enzyme that's absorbing them. It's got everything to do with the fact that, well, well actually, but finish that question. So what was the last part of that question going to be? Oh, no, no, not at all. So, um, the reason that they antagonize each other, well, I mean, I don't know. Maybe that becomes important at super high intakes, but the main reason that zinc can disturb copper balance is because zinc increases the expression of metallothionine. Metallothionine is not a transporter. It's a, 
It's a mop for metals that holds onto them. And it's your overall zinc status, not your zinc at that moment that determines your metallothionine. So if you took zinc at breakfast, actually it doesn't even matter what you took at breakfast. It matters what your zinc status is resulting from the last month of what you've been doing chronically. That's what's going to determine how much metallothionine is expressed in your intestines. When your copper gets into the intestines, it can get bound up in that metallothionine. And if that metallothionine is high and the copper gets bound up in it, what happens is every three or four days, the intestinal cells just slough off and get re go into your feces. So you're trapping copper there in the intestines and it's never getting absorbed. But that's an effect of chronic zinc status. It's not an effect of the acute meal. All right, I think we're uh, 20 minutes over time. So let's end it here and uh, I'll be around. <laughs>